Okay. If somebody wants to start reading. Scenes to be repeated. After speaking of the end of the world, Jesus comes back to Jerusalem, the city, then sitting in pride and arrogance and saying, I sit a queen and shall see no sorrow. As his prophetic eye rested upon Jerusalem, he sees that as she was given up to destruction, the world will be given up to its doom. The scenes that transpired at the destruction of Jerusalem will be repeated, the great and terrible day of the Lord, but in a more fearful manner. That was written in 1897. So has anything changed? As you can see up there, pride and arrogance. No. Nothing has changed, has it? There's still people today, every one of us around pride and everybody is arrogant. Listen to me. And this here talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. We're going to, before we get into 2300 days, I just wanted to show how much she talks about things being repeated and in a more fearful manner. Have you seen the reports on Jerusalem when it was destroyed before? Was it a fearful thing? It was a very fearful thing. Okay, the next text. The Savior's prophecy concerning the visitation of judgments upon Jerusalem is to have another fulfillment, of which that terrible desolation was but a faint shadow. In the fate of the chosen city, we may behold the doom of a world that has rejected God's mercy. So here she says, once again, it's going to be repeated, another fulfillment, for she has said it was fulfilled once, and it's going to have another fulfillment. Okay, here we have another one. Well, these prophecies received a partial fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem. They have a more direct application in the last days. Undated, uh, MS 84, Christ our helper in the great crisis. That was the, that's a chapter. Um, undated manuscript. So here she says it has a partial fulfillment. See, the previous one, she said it was completely fulfilled. But the point is it's going to occur again. Study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. We, with all our religious advantages, ought to know far more today than we do know. Angels desire to look into the truths that are revealed to the people who with contrite hearts are searching the word of God and praying for greater lengths and depths and de I'm sorry, lengths and breadths and depths and heights of the knowledge which we alone can give. Okay, study Revelation in connection with Daniel. And we'll talk about a little bit about those things later. What connection is there? I know there's 144,000 in Revelation and there's 144,000 in Daniel, but nobody talks about 144,000 in Daniel. Then it goes down and it says, uh, we with all of our religious advantages. What religious advantages do we have? The things that Ellen White told us has showed us this path that we are to take. And, of course, people want to throw her out now. Continuing. Revelation Pentecost repeated with greater power. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated with ever greater power than on that occasion. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then as at the Pentecostal season, the people w will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in, in his own tongue. So, Vern, when it says Pentecostal season, you think that's during the Pentecost? There's a good likelihood of that. Yeah. It's very good likelihood of that. That's right. Of course, uh, that's one of those things that the church has nailed to the cross. Here, we haven't nailed that to the cross. Continuing. Jesus did not answer his disciples by taking up separately the destruction of Jerusalem and the great day of his coming. 
He mingled the description of these two events. Had he opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them, they would have been unable to endure the sight. In mercy to them, he blended the description of the two great crises, leaving the disciples to study out the meaning for themselves. When he referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration in that day when the Lord shall rise out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity, when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Just a second. You want to continue? It's almost done. This entire discourse was not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. This is in Desire of Ages that she's written this. Entire discourse, not part of it. What she's talking about is Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Those entire discourses is for us. And we're going to go through that because the one, Mark 13, that discourse at, at the, towards the end of this, I will show where it goes back to the, the 2300 days. And continuing. We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Every element of power is about to be set to work. Past history will be repeated. Old controversies will arouse to new life. And peril will beset God's people on every side. Intensity is taking hold of the human family. It is permeating everything upon earth. Study Revelation in connection with Daniel, for history will be repeated. We, with all our religious advantages, ought to know far more today than we do know. When she says right there, old controversies will rise to new life. Wonder what controversies they, those are. Could the feast be one of those? Yes. And I'm not, to, not some of them like Pentecost, all of them. History will be repeated. In fact, this is from Testimonies to Ministers. If you go, that whole chapter is a very, very interesting chapter. Okay, you got another text? All that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in the place. Where am I? John stands in the place. In the revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel and thus is Daniel standing in his, in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. Manuscript. See, we've had people here before, they will quote this, and then they will stop, and they'll leave the last out on the very threshold of, this, of their fulfillment. That's putting it still future. And here is one of the ones that I really like, and somebody wants to read this. In the scriptures are presented truths that relate especially to our own time. To the period just prior to the appearing of the Son of Man, the prophecies of scripture point and hear their warnings and threatenings preeminently apply. The prophetic periods of Daniel extending to the very eve of the great consummation throw a flood of light upon these, on, upon events then to transpire. None need remain in ignorance, none need be unprepared for the coming of the day of God. The prophetic periods of Daniel then to ex uh, transpire. She puts the prophetic periods in the future here. She doesn't put them in the past. She puts them in the future. Events then to transpire.
Now let's go to the 2300 day prophecies, prophecy. And first we'll go ahead and we'll read it. Oh, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, Daniel 8, 14. So when is it? It's, uh, it's going to be cleansed at the end of the 2,300 days. Um, and continuing, let's go to Daniel. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, let's be perfectly clear that this deals with the daily, the transgression of desolation, the sanctuary trodden underfoot, and the host trodden underfoot. Those are the things in the question. And then verse 14 is the answer. In Seventh day Adventist, we always quote the answer, but they don't like talking about the question. Continuing. Daniel 8, 8. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and towards the pleasant land, which we understand is Israel. Yeah. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. Now sacrifice is a supplied word. It was not in the original. And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily Again, sacrifice is supplied by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So when it says, uh, you're right, and I have a quote later, she talks about that word sacrifice. Um, and it cast down the truth to the ground. What truth do you think that is? To me, that's the National Sunday Law. We can see it, and we'll talk about it in a little bit in Daniel 11, 30, 31, when it forsakes the Holy Covenant. That's God's Holy Covenant. So, um, Ellen White wrote a letter, and I know Ted talked about this letter. This letter was is letter 103, and it was uh, written to Hiram A. Craw on February 24, <coughs> 1904. This letter, which is letter 103, is published entirely in that quote. Dear Brother Craw, I write to ask you if you can lend me a thousand, one or two thousand dollars at a low rate of interest. If you can, it will be a great accommodation to me. I am trying to prepare for publications of many things that people should have. Who is Hiram Craw? Well, we don't know much about him, or we didn't know much about him, but we do know about this letter. Now, in some of the manuscripts, Ted's, when he was here, not this last time, but before, said that though that letter has been removed, and I told him this quote, and I said, well, Ted, I went up and told him the last year, it's letter 103, you can still find the whole letter, and it's towards the end of it. Who is Hiram Craw? They had a lot of writings, and in the register of Hiram A. Crow <coughs> Crew Collection 268, <coughs> you know, I spelled that wrong one of those places. He is remembered especially due to a letter written to him dated 24, 1904. This collection of primary diaries was brought to 
the, was bought by the Center of Adventist Research through the online auction site eBay in 2017. 2007. 2007. So I can't read. Okay, let's go and continue on. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. <clears throat> In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate, and such as do wickedly, against the covenant shall corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do now their God, do know their God, shall be strong and do exploits. This is part of the letter talking about uh, Daniel 11 and continuing. She stated verse 30, but then she quotes 30 and 31. She puts both of these verses as having and future fulfillment, letter 103. Now let's compare these two verses with Daniel 8, 13. So let's go when she says those are going to be future. Let's compare it with the, with the 2300 days. And I want you to read uh, Daniel 8, 13, and then Daniel 11, 31, and compare them to see how that they're similar, covering the same subjects. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Daniel 8, 13. Now in, now in Daniel eleven thirty one, The arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. I shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall make the abomination that makes desolate. So you go back to this letter, and this Daniel 11, 30, and 31, she says, will have a future application, will be fulfilled. It's the same thing that's in Daniel 8, 13, which is what the question about the 2300 days. So basically what that says is, she is saying that it's going to have a future application of 2300 days. If you read one, it has to be, and it's the same subject as this other, it's quoting the other. It's the same thing. I hope that's clear. <clears throat> and here we teach the statutes and the judgments. Somebody want to read that? The church is not teaching the statutes and judgments. Malachi chapter 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And this was one of John's great missions here is the statutes and the judgments. Of course, uh, Abel, that's why people say the statutes and the judgments, they put them that the, the Jewish statutes and the judgments, as we have heard here many times. Okay, what does this sign say? You come up to a stop sign, you see that, would you be confused? Oxymoron. Oxymoron. Well, I went and added something to this. I went and added, the church says no left turn. The arrow's pointing to Tarabella. Stay away from Tarabella. We say, the sign says, go to Tarabella. Anyway, that's my cuteness for the day. Okay, continuing on here, let's uh, look at about when this vision of the 2300 days 
in Daniel 8. When does Daniel 8 says that it will occur? Not the understanding of it, but when will the vision occur? So he came near where I stood, <laughs> and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. And some of them of understanding make wise, teach, shall fall, to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. So we see in Daniel 11 and Daniel 8, both of them, there's three places there, it says it's to be at the time of the end. Now was 1844 the time of the end? Some will say that was the beginning of the time of the end, and I won't argue with that because that is true. It is, for us, the beginning of it. Okay, continuing. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people, specifically a tribe as those of Israel, Daniel eight twenty four. Seventy weeks are determined, a decree upon thy people, specifically a tribe as those of Israel and upon the si holy city, one, to finish the transgression, and two, to make an end of sins, three, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and four, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and six, to seal up the vision and prophecy, uh, pardon me, five, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and six to anoint the most holy, Daniel 9.24. So you see the same word, the holy people, and in Daniel 8.24, and the people here is Daniel 9.24 that, that does these three things. We still have sin on this planet, and according to this, it's going to be the people or the 144,000 that's going to... Uh, I don't know how it's going to do. I did a whole Sabbath school just on this. And like John, he came up and says, Keith, you have to, how they're going to, I said, I have no idea how they're going to do it. I just know that we still have sin. And here on um, number two is they're going to be making an end of sins. Okay, here's another, but about Mrs. Miller, or Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller and those who were in union with him supported that the cleansing of the sanctuary spoken of in Daniel 8.14 meant the purifying of the earth by fire prior to its becoming the abode of the saints. This was to take place at the second advent of Christ. Therefore, we looked for that event at the end of the 2300 days or years. But after our, our disappointment, the scriptures were carefully searched. With prayer and earnest thought, after a period of suspense, light poured in upon our darkness. Doubt and uncertainty were swept away. Instead of the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 referring to the purifying of the earth, it was now plain that it pointed to the closing work of our high priest in heaven, the finishing to be cleansed in the future of the atonement and the preparing of the people to abide the day of his coming. So we're still waiting for the earth to be purified, and I believe that will occur after when it, the whole earth is, is made new again. Here you see the sanctuary. There's two apartments to the sanctuary, which a lot of people in the church don't even talk about anymore. But then there was one point, you see this picture. What's different about this picture? 
veil's gone. When did that occur? At the crucifixion. When I first looked at this, I said, well, this isn't right. He's in the, the holy place, and he can see into the most holy place. But then I remembered, crucifixion, that veil was ripped. Continuing. In their investigation, they learned that there is no scripture evidence sustaining the popular view that the earth is a sanctuary. But they found in the Bible a full explanation of the subject of the sanctuary, its nature, location, and services. Those who followed in the light of the prophetic word saw that instead of coming to the earth at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844, which would have cleansed the sanctuary, Christ then entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing, not cleansed yet, work of atonement preparatory to his coming. Now those in italics was my, I added those because I believe that there's another application coming to it. So this here is uh, part of that test that they had in 1844 and that the people that went to the Bibles and with Bereans like they were supposed to, they got answers. And today, we should be doing the same thing. At the time appointed for the judgment began the work of investigation and blotting out of sins, the prophecy clearly states, cleansed, not began. All who have ever taken place themselves, the name of Christ must pass its searching scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. You see, I've added that again. The prophecy clearly states, cleansed. She said here, in this here, began the work of investigation and the blotting out of sins. And I believe that uh, it'll have a future application where it's completely cleansed. So what does this mean? Let's see uh, um, what Mrs. White says about what's going to happen at the end with Lucifer. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great de deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic of being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John the Revelation. Okay, uh, we're going to look and see this description of what John gives of Christ. But if you see there, he's not going to just be sitting in a temple in Jerusalem. In different parts of the earth, he will manifest himself. So it will be, you know... Everybody will see what, what this is what's, that is uh, going on. So let's see what John says when he gives a description of him. Revelation 1. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, the, and grit about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a frame of fire. And his feet likened to the fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as a sound of many waters. So when he is going to appear as Christ... It's going to look just like Christ. The only thing that he can't deceive the people is the manner of his coming. So that's what he should look like. 
according to what Mrs. White wrote. Now let's go back and let's look at some of the things that's involved with the 2300 days. It is suggested that the daily must be carefully defined as a principle, namely the self-exalting character of paganism inherent in mankind of which Arianism became integrated. The essence of the daily is the mystery of iniquity, which seeks to become like God. The point of commonality between the daily and the abomination which desolates is a mystery of iniquity which seeks to become like God. Actually, he will actually take his place down here. Um, I have about ten books on the daily on my computer, and this is uh, one of them. Continuing. Then, L. R. Conradi of in Germany reinterpreted the daily as referring to the true sanctuary service and Christ's high priestly ministry in heaven. Conradi believed the papacy took away Christ's priestly ministry by substituting the mass and a system of human priesthood in which the pope had assumed the position of, Christ, of Jesus. This so-called new view of the daily was not new at all, but was taught and held in many prince, uh, held in principle by many of the leading Protestant reformers. In reality, what many considered new light was the view embraced by William Miller and the pioneers, which leads to fundamental and funda foundational pillar of the Seventh Day Adventist Adventism. The sanctuary doctrine, however, by 1919, many prominent church leaders, including A.G. Daniels and W.W. W. Prescott, accepted Conradi's view of the daily. Conradi and many other apostatized by gradually adopting divergent views concerning the heavenly sanctuary and rejecting the inspiration of E.G. White. So uh, William Miller, this here problem that we talk about the daily, William Miller actually had adopted some of those things from other people also. It all didn't originate with William Miller, according to this here. And in 1919, what happened in 1919? That was the Bible conference. And I am still reading it at home. Okay, next. I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. So do you reflect the image of Jesus fully? This is what the 144,000 are going to be. Um, and this is what we are to be is in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest, we have to reflect the image of Christ. When people see us, they must see Christ in us. And I know myself, that's been a struggle. I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of the holy God. Those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it 
and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. And why do I put that in there? Because it all deals with things that happens in the sanctuary, this sanctuary that needs to be cleansed. We need to purify us because if we don't purify us, we will not be able to stand in front of him. Then I saw in Revelation to the daily, Daniel 8, 12, that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave. The judgment, our cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily, but in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844 and it never will, never will again be a test. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. I saw that some were getting a false ex excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs no time to strengthen it and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. So, and I, you know, some, in response to David Gage, is somebody, you know, one of them went and had this quote, but they didn't have all of the quote. Now, I, I have a question here. If there's not going to be any time periods at the very end and will be cut short in righteousness, what's going to be cut short in righteousness? I believe it's one of those time periods, maybe the 2300 days. I don't know. But see, this is one of those things that if you don't quote the whole thing, you don't get an entire picture of everything that's involved. And in 1844, when it says time has not been a test since 1844, I believe the test was that whoever rejected the 2300 days there was, what, how many people, 50,000 people in that movement, and only 50 survived? The 50 people survived that test. The test was not the time period. The test was, are you still going to serve Christ? And that's my opinion. Early Writings, very wonderful book. There's a lot of stuff in Early Writings. So let's go to, uh, to Mark 13, and let's read what it says in there. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is a, as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, least coming suddenly he find you sleeping and what I say unto you I say unto all watch also and the gospel must first be published preached proclaimed published among all nations that was verse 10 so if you go to uh, if you go uh, which I did not put here verse 14 but when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet that's the 2300 days Standing where it ought not to, let him understand, let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. And then it goes down to verse 30 and says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. That's the people that see these things. 
So on 1844, did they see those? No. They're still future. And it will be the last generation. That includes wars and rumors and wars. That includes the sun, moon, signs in the sun, moon, and stars. That includes the earthquakes. That includes a lot of things. That also include, if you and if you include the the uh, abomination of desolation and the daily, that includes Daniel 12 also. This generation shall not pass till all these things are done. In other words, they are going to be seeing them. Because the verse before that, when ye shall see these things come to pass, not hear about them many years ago, when you shall see them come to pass. That's in verse 29. And now let's compare Mark 13 and 14 with Daniel 8, 13. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the Daniel the prophet, standing there it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Then I heard once saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot and you see we just saw before that it says, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the door. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. And that is part of what is talking about there. And that is it. Um, is that a sunrise or a sunset? Um, there was a video that uh, Sandy sent out, and I went and transcribed. I got three copies here. Did anybody see the video about uh, Nashville, Tennessee? I forget the guy's name that did it. It's an incredible video. In that video, there is, according to the video in 2015, there was a whole bunch of LMG white documents that was released and one of those documents talks about a vision she saw in Nashville and I have three pages only of a quote and I think uh, in the next two or three days I'll find that video again and I'll send it to the people on my email list because it is very enlightening shall we have uh, bow our heads for prayer dear Heavenly Father thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day that you have given us Please get the pride and the arrogance out of our lives. Please have the character of you in our lives so when people see us, they will see you. Please have us with the sayings of not my will, but your will will be done. In your name, amen.